How should we understand Genesis 1 through 11? Is it history? Is it poetry? Is it mythical? It doesn't even matter. I'm joined today by Dr. Joe Miller, a Christian scholar who's going to help us unpack these questions. Uh, Joe, first of all, welcome. Uh, it's good to be here. Thanks for having me. Uh, why is it so important that we get the literary genre of Genesis 1 to 11 correct? You know, genre, literary genre is an important thing. And in some circles, that's a bad word. In some word, that's the only word that matters. In some circles, in some circles that is. Um, genre matters because it helps us understand how to read the text. So we can look at a, a non-controversial area like the Psalms and say, okay, that's a genre of poetry. Or we can look at another type of prophetic literature and say, okay, that's a genre, there's a prophetic genre in there. And that helps us give textual clues of how to understand what certain words mean and how we should then apply that properly to our context today. So the same is true holds really for Genesis 1 through 11. That's true of all scripture, that genre helps us identify and interpret and then properly apply the, the yeah. meaning, the text. Now, I mean, does Genesis 1 to 11, in your view, take on maybe special importance? Uh, because it feels to me that there's a lot of ideas that flow out of Genesis 1 to 11 that yeah. are doctrinally foundational to the Christian faith. At this point in our culture, especially, it takes on huge significance and importance and because of the debates going on around the book of Genesis, whether it's myth or whether it's history. And then that leads to the discussions, of course, on what's the origins of humanity. And so while I think it's always been a, a central and critical doctrine, both biblically and since you know, the ancient time of the Hebrews to the early New Testament Christians throughout church history, I think within our cultural context right now, it has a, even a greater significance because it's really at the center of so many debates and disagreements, even amongst believers. Yeah, so there's a, a lot of uh, today evangelical and conservative Christian scholars who would argue that Genesis 1 through 11 is just another one of the uh, creation myths that were mm. part of the ancient mm -hmm. Near Eastern world. Uh, and so, uh, in your view, is Genesis 1 through 11 mythical? Yeah, no, in my study, in my time that goes back to looking at the Old Testament and all that, uh, even to my undergrad days, believe it or not, as an engineer, I took a, one class in Old Testament from a guy that we talked about this. So I've always been fascinated by this topic. But in my studies over the years, I'd have to say, no, I, I don't think it fits that category in terms of understanding the content. Now, some of the genre elements certainly overlap in terms of imagery and, and figurative language and stuff. So, but it's a category error to say that that genre determines the historicity of the content. Does that make, I mean, does that distinction yeah, make sense? Yeah, so, so the, the, the idea would be that, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, the idea would be that well, because it was, you know, given to people mm -hmm. uh, in that, in the ancient Near Eastern world, of course you're going to expect to see similarities yeah. just for that reason alone. It's, it, it's part of that, that cultural milieu. Yeah. Exactly. It's the, it was a storytelling culture. And so when we hear stories, when we watch movies, I mean, they're all, they follow a certain pattern because that makes sense within the, the consciousness and the mind and the perceptions of the people in the culture. And what I, what I would argue, what many scholars argue, is that Genesis just took those cultural expectations of style and genre, but, but used those to convey something that had historical truth distinct in its content although similar to the genre to those other ancient yeah. myths. Yeah, well, you know, there's a, a, an Old Testament scholar that I think both you and I really admire, and it's John Oswalt, yeah. who wrote a book, uh, uh, let's see, The Bible Among Myths. Is yes, that, is Bible that Among Other Myths, yeah. Yeah, it's an excellent book that we highly commend. Uh, and, and so he argues uh, along the same lines as you that really... Uh, that there is a fundamental difference between mm -hmm. Genesis 1 through 11 and the ancient Near Eastern creation myths. Yeah. What is the basis of that difference? And, and maybe give us some yeah. examples. Well, I'd say one of those, yeah. Plus, yeah, love John Oswald, what he did. He actually got to be the reader for my master's thesis on that, which when he agreed to do that, I was so excited because I was like, man, here's a, a legit scholar that I admire greatly for the stand he's taken in his scholarship. And I was excited for that. So I have to get that out to, to John because I appreciate his involvement with that. But um, yeah, I think one of the core issues that he would say is, look, uh, ancient Near East mythologies were cyclical in nature. In other words, there was a death and life cycle. 
you know, the, the daily cycle of the world was mm -hmm. a, the gods, the death and rising of gods. And so that meant really that human history was a cyclical history. There was no beginning, there was no middle, there was no end. Consequently, there was no real eternal purpose to the lives of humans. Humans were accidental. They're, they're really leeches on the life of the gods in, mm -hmm. in those ancient mythologies. But because Hebrew uh, cosmology and Hebrew origins had a linear history, it had a beginning, a middle, and an end, an ultimate purpose, humanity was more than just these sort of leeches on society. They had a significance, they had a value and purpose, mm -hmm. and therefore the revelation of their origins told them the way you act, your moral decision making, matters. The way you treat one another matters. It has mm -hmm. eternal value. And that was extremely different from the mythologies of the ancient Near East. Yeah, and, and the pers perspective on, uh, on, on God is very different too, is that right? Yeah, I mean, so just even the idea of monotheism versus polytheism. It was this sort of pantheistic or panentheistic, really, uh, worldview for these ancient Near East people, where the gods themselves really didn't matter, because they could die, they could be replaced, because they were really connected to establishing political authority and political power and regional power, right? So the gods were really tools to establish a king or a ruler. But for the, new, for the, you know, the Hebrews, there was one god and one god alone. He wasn't battling with these other gods for control or power. Therefore, he was not a regional god. He was a god of the world. He was a god of all peoples, regardless of their mm -hmm. ethnic uh, origins. And so we see that theme very strongly in the Old Testament. And I'm teaching a class right now. We're talking about this, and I'm trying to mm -hmm. emphasize to the students. God's purpose was always open to every ethnic group. It was always an open promise, an open covenant. Uh, and so because of their monotheism, because of that origin, and they knew that that was true, they knew that God was a God of the world. And of course, the view of humanity is very different in Genesis 1 through 11 versus the ancient Near Eastern creation myths. Maybe unpack that just a smidge. Yeah, a, a bit. again, that kind of goes back a little bit to that idea that, you know, humans, for the gods of the ancient Near East, were you know no different than cattle or parasites uh, they were just sort of fodder for the gods their battles you know sometimes oh you like those humans i'm going to kill them and the god so it justified the wars and the battles between communities because if the gods are battling certain groups then i oppose those groups it justified the dehumanization of others for the for the hebrews understanding that that all humans began with this first couple adam and eve and all humans were from you know, that first couple all had this sacred worth. All were created in the image of God. Now, did the Hebrews always, were they always faithful to live that out? No. But they always knew that that was wrong when they didn't live it out because they had an objective standard by which God, Yahweh, could judge them for their sin against other humans. So in terms of these differences then, what does that tell us about the literary genre of Genesis 1 through 11? And, and yeah. do you see... Uh, maybe uh, Genesis 1 through 11 is justifiably being understood as history. Yeah, so I would definitely say that the genre of Genesis uh, is significant in terms of understanding. There's, there's nuance and there's meaning in knowing the ancient Near East civilization and the mm -hmm. cultures and the kings and the stories. It gives flavor, it gives color. It's like watching something in black and white versus color. We can mm -hmm. see it in technicolor mm -hmm. when we understand this. So that's, that's, that's wonderful. But the core message is there, whether we understand ancient Near East or not, and that is it's a historical narrative, which is not the kind of history we tell today still. It's, it's, a, it's a theological narrative with a very specific purpose, mm -hmm. and that purpose was to show that God cared not just about the eternal and the immaterial, but the material world that he created. And so it tells that material origins of the world as it's tied to the theological purpose mm -hmm. for God's creation. And we can't divide those two. Any view that divides the material from the immaterial ends up in really leading down a troubled road of doctrine. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you, Joe. That's been very helpful in terms of just giving us some added insight into how we should think about the, the literary genre of Genesis 1 through 11 and, and how it relates to the ancient Near East.